And are you with him now? Well, I might just go and stab him again, but... All right, do not stab him again. Why? Okay, so just listen to my voice, okay? Yes. Stay on the line with me. I am complimentary. Okay, are you with the patient now? Well, I'm in the lounge and he's a bit too bleeding to death with any luck. You need to help him, okay? No, I'm not. All right, madam, how many him. times have you stabbed him? Um, I did the once. You did the once? And then he said I would do it again, so I did it four times. So, okay, so in total, how many times? Uh, three times. Three times, okay. Uh, once. I thought I'd get his heart. Well, one. Police found she had written this confession note. I have taken so much abuse over the years, she wrote. Look at my records. He was a good daddy, but the mask slipped tonight. I accept my punishment. May he rot in hell. What you just heard there is 66-year-old retired accountant Penelope Jackson on the phone to police. She has just stabbed her husband of over 20 years multiple times with the intention of ending his life. As Penny is on the phone, David Jackson lay out on the kitchen floor bleeding out, living out his final seconds cold and alone with the only person who is close enough to help refusing. It's not certain whether the help would have saved him, but it is certain that he didn't make it and passed away on the 13th of February 2021. That's where the certainties end however, because the rest of this case is not as straightforward. We will take a look at the body cam footage released and use the info that is publicly available to try and get a better understanding of the people involved and just how such a tragic and seemingly cold-blooded murder could happen in a sleepy part of the UK perpetrated by a 66-year-old pensioner. Penny and Dave had been married for 24 years and had three kids they raised together. Before meeting Dave, Penny married her first husband at the age of 18 and had two daughters with him before leaving after claiming he turned violent. The court then heard how Penny's second husband had been gay and come out and that her third husband had taken his own life when he discovered Penny was having an affair with Dave. Penny's youngest daughter, Isabella, was fathered by her third husband, but was raised by Dave as his own from birth and later was adopted by him. The jury heard David Jackson had two daughters and a son from his first marriage, which also ended when he had an affair that later blossomed into a relationship, until that ended due to Dave having another affair, but this time with Penny, and then the two did end up settling down. I'm sorry if that is a little confusing, but I do feel it's important context. In summary, they both had affairs, divorces and marriages, but eventually found each other and were seemingly happy. Or were they? Shortly after Penny and Dave married in 1996, Dave's son took his own life after going through a divorce, leaving a note that stated he didn't want to be like his dad. Dave, a retired army lieutenant colonel, was far from perfect. A number of witnesses, including the couple's pregnant daughter, Isabel Potterton, also shared a deep insight into the couple's personal lives. According to Miss Potterton, who is the lady Dave adopted, she had witnessed three times where her father had been violent towards her mother three incidents of what was referred to as serious aggression that took place around 97 or 98. She said that Dave had forced Penny against a wall and given her a bloody nose and had also pulled a knife on her in a separate incident. Miss Potterton also described a third occasion when her father smashed a mug that was given to him as a present in front of Penny, but she agreed that her parents seemed to be enjoying a happy retirement together and had lots of shared interests, such as a love of cruise holidays and gardening. Meanwhile, Dave's stepdaughter, Jane Carvely, who was Dave's daughter from his first marriage, claimed that Penny seemed to enjoy baiting people. Ms Carvely said, 
I always felt everything had to revolve around Penny. She was a very larger than life character. She would enjoy making people uncomfortable. Continuing to say, for me, the defendant liked baiting people for fun, for sport. She liked to see my father uncomfortable and she enjoyed that. Citing a story of when they were all on holiday together as evidence for this claim. This is all irrelevant because Penny claimed Dave had coercively controlled her, including preventing her from seeing friends and even decided what she watched on telly. Throughout the trial, Penny claimed her husband was violent towards her and told the court on the night of the killing he had called her pathetic when she told him she wanted to kill herself. The jury had been told to focus on the issue of lack of intent and loss of control when reaching their verdicts by the defence, and this is what the trial was going to be centred around. It's not up for debate whether or not Penny is the killer, rather to what degree she is culpable due to aggravating and mitigating factors. But how exactly did we get to this point? Okay, at this moment in time, okay, you need to listen to my colleague. Um, under arrest suspicion of attempt murder, mate. Under arrest yeah, suspicion of attempt murder. And you do not have to say anything, but it may, it may harm your defence. You do not mention when questioned anything you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Um, I'll go in to see what they do. Yeah. Could I get my coat? Just bear with me two seconds. In all right. there. I admit it all. All right. Just get them. All right. I want to go in. All right. No, so, he's on the kitchen yeah. floor. Can someone just stay with Devon while I go in? There's nothing nasty. And I'm certainly not. not my coat's in the... Yeah, Ow, just wait two seconds. Alright, you okay? You alright? If there's any luck, you'll be too late. Alright. The couple were celebrating Penny's birthday on the day of the incident, the 13th of February 2021, and the dispute started from something you may be surprised at. After a seemingly normal day of celebrating together, the pair decided to eat an expensive meal bought for them by their daughter. While on a video call, the court heard that Dave began to get angry with Penny due to her bringing out a cheap side dish made from a leftover Sunday dinner to go with the expensive meal. It's unclear why this upset Dave so much, but the video call soon ended after that. Their daughter, of course slightly worried at the event she had witnessed, texted her mum, Penny, to see if things were okay and she replied saying things were fine, to not worry and they would talk in the morning. Just one hour from that message being sent, Dave would be dead on his kitchen floor. It's unclear what happened in the run up to the murder, but what we do know is Dave phoned the police first, although this part has not been released to the public, likely due to it being graphic in nature. The court heard this part of the 999 call and it's reported that you could hear him scream in anguish. This was said to be from the final two stab wounds, making the total three. She first stabbed him in the bedroom, in the chest, and Penny later said to the police she aimed for his heart, but he didn't have one. It's then thought Dave rushed to the phone for help, and this is when Penny pursued him further, and stabbed him another two times, killing him. She said she stabbed him the second and third time, because Dave was provoking her. Penny then came onto the call and told the operator he's in the kitchen bleeding to death with any luck, repeatedly acknowledging what she had done as she refused to give emergency aid over an 18 minute period until the police showed up. We do have some parts of that phone call and I personally find her demeanour comes off as incredibly cold and callous. She sounds so completely disassociated, her voice is incongruent with her words. In any sense, Admitting to killing someone like that if you've never done it before would be hard to do with a straight face for most people. You could chalk this down to shock, but she keeps this same level of remorse pretty much the whole time. Once the police arrived, the situation got even more strange, with her saying some outright ghoulish stuff directed towards her now deceased husband of 24 years. We also have body cam footage of some of these interactions and I'll play them in full as I think they need no explanation. 
And are you with him now? Well, I might just go and stab him again, but... Alright, do not stab him again. Why? Okay, so just listen to my voice. Okay? Yes. Stay on the line I with am, me. I am complimenting. Okay, are you with the patient now? Well, I'm in the lounge and he's in the kitchen bleeding to death with any luck. You need to help him, okay? No, I'm not. Alright, madam. I don't How many times have you stabbed him? Um, I did the once. You did the once? And then he said I wouldn't do it again, so I did it first more. So, okay. So, in total, how many times? Uh, three times. Three times, okay. Uh, once I thought I'd get his heart, well, he hasn't got one, and then twice in the abdomen. Hello, madam. Do you want to just step outside for me a minute? Can you, can you come outside? Yes. Thank you. He's on the kitchen floor. Okay, at this moment in time, okay, if you just listen to my colleague, um, under arrest suspicion of attempt murder, mate. Under arrest yeah, suspicion of attempt murder. And you do not have to say anything about it, mate. It may harm your defence. You do not mention when questioned anything you're later relying in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Um, I'll go in and see what they do. Yeah. Could I have kept my coat? Just bear with me two seconds. In all right. there. I admit it all. Alright. Just get them. Alright, I want to go in. Alright. No, so, he's on the kitchen yeah. floor. Can someone just stay with Devon while I go in? There's nothing nasty, and I'm certainly not, not, oh, my coat's in the, yeah, just Ow, wait two seconds, alright, you okay? You alright? If there's any luck, right. you'll be too late. Alright. What's your name, Anna? Uh, well, I'm called Penny, but Penelope Jackson. Where do you live here? Uh so you do live here? Yes. Can I get my coat? We'll get you right, coat get the ambulance in, pronto. We need oh, CPR. Oh, don't. No, no, no. Please don't. Oh, I should have stabbed him a bit more. We've got CPR being done at the moment. Can we get him right. out of the car? Yeah. Come on. Come with me, mate. You want my keys? Sure. I... Okay. Yes. I stabbed him once because he's a... He's an aggressive bully and nasty and I've had enough. And when he said you wouldn't do it, I did it twice more. Coats in... What colour is your coat? In the front, yeah. grey, grey wardrobe. Okay, it there's might be a, a while, all right, oh, but I'll try and get it. There's obviously a lot going on, okay? Oh, right, but with any luck, it'll be too late. My, Penelope, my advice is don't, don't talk about it now, okay? No, no, I have no, no intention of not agreeing to what I've done. Okay. I know what I've done. All right. And I know why I've done it, and if I haven't done it properly, I'm really annoyed. Mm. Oh. All right, Penny. Um, I'm arresting, further arresting you for murder. Oh, um, good. I've already cautioned you, yes. so your necessities for your arrest is for a prompt and effective investigation, yep. and to stop further harm. Sorry, that out. one's a bit tight. So, Penny, we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna move them to the, the rear in a minute. The side, the um, DO's just come out to um, check your temperature, and then right we'll you. we'll move you in. Just and then we'll go there. Just stay there for the time being. All right. Oh, my slippers. Alright. I'm not Jotting her out. exactly. Yeah. Alright, step out, mind dread. Yeah. I'm very sorry for being a nuisance. It's quite eerie to witness someone who has just committed murder confess so clearly and nonchalantly, even going as far as to say she is compus mentis. Uh, of course meaning that she's lucid and knows exactly what she's saying and has done. There is a really good little interview with psychologist Emma Kenny and ex-police detective Peter Blexley and they share some interesting thoughts about the case as professionals. The clip is from the British show This Morning but I'll leave a link 
to an hour and a half video by Emma Kenny about this topic where she goes into much more detail on the case. Yeah, I mean, you're right. When you look at aggravating and mitigating factors, the aggravating factors are that she obviously wanted him to die. She made it clear she wanted him to die. Mitigation is that she said that she was being bullied. But I think what we see there is just a real mismatch between what we expect to see during an experience where you've killed somebody, albeit, let's say, worst case scenario, she was being coercively controlled. And she then went ahead and did that in a rage of passion and fit. But the reality is that she'd be distressed and she isn't distressed, this is disassociation. And one of the big problems with that is when you show a jury that kind of detail, and it is very minute to minute detail orientated now because of the recordings, there's going to be a bias instantly, which is this does not seem rationally in keeping with the way we'd expect somebody who's dramatically killed somebody in this moment of rage. It doesn't feel emotionally correct. And that's a big problem when a jury is viewing this kind of information. What can happen inside someone's head when they have been the perpetrator of someone something so catastrophic right in front of them um, have you have you seen that Emma before that that you almost lock yourself down you become emotionless um, you decide to own it own the situation yeah, I mean, I don't think for one minute she thought she was ever going to get away with what she did. And I do think there is a quite a severe level of compartmentalization about the way that she's approaching the crime and what she's carried out and the reality of the ramifications that was just noted by um, the individual that was just talking about the crime itself. The point is that we expect to see a level, some level of associated reaction with that situation. And there isn't really. She has a very low relationship with her emotion in that moment in time. And the problem with that is that it doesn't fit with the expectations of what is meant to happen and play out. You're going to be upset. You're going to be a bit chaotic. She seems to almost feel justified. And the problem you've got is with coercive control and bullying and all the things that she accuses of him, him of, the point is that she doesn't seem to react in a way that really mirrors that situation. She doesn't show that she's out of control. She seems to have wished to go ahead and carry it out. She seems quite satisfied with her work, which is a problem when we're looking yeah. at those mitigation factors, which is what she's asked for. Peter, we, we seem to be, I mean, we seem to love true crime. There is no web. We seem to be more drawn to it more than ever, particularly when there's a there's a woman at the heart of it, when there's a, there's a woman who's murdering. Why is this so alluring for people? Is it because that you normally stereotypically see a woman as the nurturer and the mother figure? So it just so goes against type. 93% of murders are committed by men. Mm. So Penelope Jackson comes from a tiny percentage of, of, of those people who, who carry out such crimes. So there is an increased fascination about how a woman would carry out a crime as abominable as, as this one. So I think that is a, a major part of the reason mm. why the true crime fascination that so many millions of people have is even in sharper focus for this case. And you're, uh, you're nodding, uh, Emma. Yeah, I mean, when you think about things like psychopathy, not saying that this particular individual is a psychopath, but I'm saying that in the population of females, it's between 0.3 and 0.7%. In the violent prison population, it's 11% in females. So it's very rare in comparison to their male counterparts. And it's the same with violence per se. You know, women are brought up in a different way sometimes in our situations. We're brought up as nurturers, parents, all these kind of ideas that we're meant to be loving and empathic and compassionate. And most of us fit into those categories quite nicely. But there are individuals who don't. And it's hard for people to wrap their heads around it. We like women to seem kind, nurturing, loving, empathic. We don't like them falling outside of those narratives. So when you see a crime like this, and as well, Peter will be as aware as I am about the reality of how now, minute by minute, we see these play out. So it's not just that the public has this opinion. They now have insight into the behavior of the individual carrying out the crime because it's on body cam. You're seeing it reported 24-7. So you're not just a voyeur now. You're able to analyze this diligently, psychologically, on all levels, just by being a viewer. It's not just about having this morbid fascination. Our brains are wired, of course, to look at negatives more likely than positives because we want to protect ourselves, so we're drawn to it. But the fact that women love true crime shows you that actually it's not because we have this morbid fascination. We want to understand what sets those individuals who kill aside from individuals who choose not to. Because the question here is, could somebody have walked away could there have been a different outcome? And the truth is, as Peter said, 
there could have been. And also the ramifications are that we have individuals affected by this crime now who are innocent parties to this awful situation. And realistically, we have to learn from these kind of encounters. Do you think um, someone can just snap in that moment? I mean, it's a sort of age old question, isn't it? Like, are you kind of born evil or do you become evil? Like, did she just snap? Is any one of us now under the right circumstances capable of murder? Some people do just snap. And, and, and their actions can lead to somebody dying. But that, generally speaking, would fall under the category of manslaughter. Mm. With a murder charge, there has to be intent. And with that intent, so often comes an element of planning. And of course, the person has to be of sane mind. So they are very clear and distinctive cases. And in this case, Penelope Jackson pleaded guilty to manslaughter. But of course, the prosecution didn't accept that guilty plea and proceeded with the murder charge. So. Yes, somebody can snap, but it tends to fall into a different category mm, of crime. Mm. Um, are there grounds for appeal? Quite possibly. She, uh, Penelope was represented by a very capable defence team, and I'm sure they will be poring over the proceedings during the court to see if she can apply for a right to appeal. Emma? Yeah, I mean, I think she will appeal. I do recognise that that sentence of 18 years is a very harsh sentence, realistically, when you compare it to other crimes that have played out in similar fashion. So I think they'll have grounds on that level. I also think that there'll probably be grounds on the fact that the bias was presented pretty much because of the way that the body cam and it played out very publicly in that way. It does create, whether we like it or otherwise, an idea that that individual was cold and callous and maybe the mitigating factors such as was she bullied, etc., need to be explained explored again in the future and I think you're absolutely right that that will happen. We uh, we obviously weren't in. As Emma Kenny says, to see a 66 year old lady commit such a crime and be totally unbothered by it is something that would be shocking for most to see. In society we tend to see women as kind and caring so it's incredibly hard to wrap your head around it. In a situation where someone has been coercively controlled, physically and sexually abused and trapped, it's thought they would be overcome with emotions after killing the person responsible for all that. Data on situations where a lady has suffered extensively at the hands of an abuser and then gone on to kill their abuser are limited. Data on situations where a lady has suffered extensively at the hands of an abuser and then gone on to kill their abuser are limited. But a report done by panelreform.org states that the number could be as high as 70% of women that kill their husband do it in response to some form of abuse and although the law is very far behind with regards to mitigating factors in this type of case there are things that exist like the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act or the DVSGA that has been recently introduced in New York as well as battered wife syndrome being recognised by courts in various parts of the world. Battered wife syndrome is describing the psychological mindset and the emotional state of female victims of abuse. Developed by Dr. Lenore E. Walker, it aims to explain why women often stay in abusive relationships and also the slow burn reaction, where women in a situation of abuse tend not to react instantly to the abuse, partly for psychological reasons, but also because of the physical mismatch between the abuser and the victim has also been recognised. But still, women are far more likely to be the victim than the perpetrator. In the majority of jurisdictions reviewed, there is no specific legislative basis for a history of abuse to be considered as a mitigating factor, and therefore, requests for more lenient treatment have been brought within the existing framework of the criminal law. Typically, offenders have sought to couch their pleas for more lenient treatment in terms of existing defences. Attempts by victim of abuse to rely on self-defence, temporary insanity and provocation where available, have been met with varying degrees of success in different jurisdictions. In practice, in all jurisdictions considered, defendants can present evidence of a history of abuse. However, only some jurisdictions' laws explicitly confer a right to bring such evidence and the extent to which it's taken into account as a mitigating factor differs dramatically across the jurisdictions. I'll leave some links in the description if you would like to read further on this, but let's move on to the trial.
many had already confessed and pleaded guilty to manslaughter but on the grounds of diminished responsibility. This would be hard to prove given her observable behaviour during the call and arrest. She seemed to know exactly what she was doing and didn't sound even slightly upset or over emotional to the point when murder could have been a rational choice for her. Penny said she was going to kill herself but then Dave provoked her so instead she attacked him and basically snapped. However, the call was first made during the attack and the police arrived 18 minutes after. It would be a very tough story to sell to a jury because to most who watch the footage, something feels amiss. Judge Picton told them Jackson's defence rests on the issue of a lack of intent to kill and loss of self-control. He said they must consider whether a person in similar circumstances possessed of a normal degree of tolerance and self-restraint would have acted in the same way. He said, if you are sure that such a person would not have reacted in such a way, the defence of loss of self-control would not apply and your verdict on the charge of murder would be guilty, Judge Picton said. If, however, you decide that such a person would or may have reacted in a similar way to the defendant, then the defence of loss of self-control would apply, and your verdict would be not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. And in short, that basically means would somebody who was effectively normal in that same situation have done the same thing? And the jury ruled guilty of first degree murder. They didn't think that a normal person would have acted in a similar way in that similar situation, imposing a life sentence with an 18 year minimum term after a 10 to 2 majority verdict from a jury of 8 women and 4 men. The judge also said, I have no doubt you intended to kill your husband and it was a premeditated murder. Your behaviour shows a shocking level of callousness. During the four days of giving evidence, I did not detect a shred of genuine remorse on your part for the crime you have committed. There were no doubt tensions in the marriage, points of friction, the lockdown will have accentuated, but I'm quite sure he was nothing like the person you claimed. This case is likely to prompt debates over abuse allegations. Some domestic violence experts believe juries often do not understand the concept of coercive control and are given no guidance to help them and there are reasonable grounds to make that claim. But addressing the court, David Jackson's estranged daughter from a former marriage, Jane Carvely, accused Penelope Jackson of being the abuser in the relationship and suggested she had taken advantage of a culture that does not support male victims of domestic abuse. To wrap this up, I'd just like to say I'm really torn about this one. If what Penny says is true, then it's a tragedy and a complete failure of the justice system but it's really hard to shake how she was being afterwards. I think we have enough there to say it didn't really seem like she was out of control or had just recently been, but how do I know what she looks like and acts after a situation like that? It's hard to say because we'd all of course act differently. It's always hard to say that somebody else would act in a certain way when you don't even really know how yourself would act in that particular situation. I think it is important that we explore these ideas because there's something to be said about courts being far behind in regards to allegations of abuse and that being taken into account and being used as a mitigating factor as it absolutely should. I think it's incredibly unfair to penalise somebody for effectively breaking out of a prison that it was unfairly put in. I'll ultimately leave it up to you to decide, the wonderful viewer, who I do thank from the very bottom of my heart for watching till the end. If you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe and let YouTube know we exist, it helps us out loads, but take care out there, hope to see you in the next one. Peace.